The following presentation was recorded live at Color Lab's 20th Annual Convention. This is tape number 25, Business 2. I'd like to welcome you to the second of the business sessions at this Color Lab Convention. At this particular session, we are going to speak to the subjects of insurance programs as currently available through Color Lab. We will also discuss the u utilization of home computers or PCs for record keeping purposes for your square dance calling business. And then we'll be having some extensive presentation of information about federal income taxes. On the panel this afternoon, we have George White, our executive secretary for Caller Lab, who will be giving you information about the Caller Lab insurance programs. Uh, George, as you know, is from Rochester, Minnesota. We have from New Jersey, Roy Gatta, who is the spouse of a member of the Board of Governors of Caller Lab and also a, as a partner, a spouse for a caller for 20 years, has been doing the record keeping uh, for that caller. Roy is a school teacher by profession and will be utilizing his PC, which he has brought with him, to uh, give you some information about record keeping. My name is Greg Anderson. I'm from Colorado. I will be presenting a slide presentation. That's mainly to keep you awake. Uh, on income taxes, because I realized uh, a long time ago that income taxes can be rather a tedious, tedious uh, process to talk about. I'm hoping that that won't dissuade any of you who are listening on tape at a later date who are not here present at the convention uh, just because this is a slide presentation, everything will hopefully be presented clearly verbally over the tape so that you will be able to also get a lot out of this session. So without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over to George White for the insurance portion of this program. The, the question was asked, do we have any more of the insurance certificates? Those will be available later if... Uh, some of the, the, the brochures on the insurance certificates I put on the back table, and if they are not available right now, we will be able to get them later. There are some, I, there are some of those available I just saw. George? Uh, the, the insurance certificates are, won't be any good to you because they were for last year's policy. Remember, our policy year ends March 31st, a new year begins April 1st, and we have not yet received the certificates from our, our current uh, insurance carrier. Thank you, Greg. My role here is not so much as to make a presentation on insurance, but to answer any questions that you might have on the insurance programs of Color Lab. I'll take just a couple of minutes ex to explain the program that we have and then give you a few minutes to ask questions about those policies. The, the main policy that you receive, you pay for along with your dues and fees uh, to, to Color Lab, is a $2 million liability policy. That policy has two parts. It has a liability part and it has what's called an AD&D part or accidental death and dismemberment. If you have a copy of your or see a copy of your insurance certificate, the upper half of the certificate is the proof of your liability insurance. The lower half of the certificate is your proof of the AD&D coverage. The $2 million coverage that we have is a group policy. That means the insurance carrier can only write it to a specific group of people, in this case, square dance callers. The $2 million limit says that each and every caller that is a member of Caller Lab and lives in the, in the United States has $2 million worth of liability insurance. Technically, every caller could have a judgment of $2 million against them, and the insurance company would back that up. Contrast that to other group policies you may have heard of, which are advertised as $2 million aggregate policy. That means the group has $2 million of coverage. If two callers should each get a million dollar claim settled against them, the, the, the institution no longer has any insurance because they've used their $2 million. So that's what to look for when you look at, at group insurance, liability insurance, is, is what the aggregate is. We have a $2 million aggregate per person. Some organizations have a $2 million aggregate for the association. 
And basically, a liability policy covers you should you be sued for some action you take or some action you forget to take. If a dancer is hurt on your dance floor, he or she is not automatically covered by your insurance. Technically, you must be sued by that person before our insurance company would pay out anything. We have had cases where a person has been hurt. They did not sue the caller, but they did file a claim with the insurance company, and the insurance company settled it. That is because the insurance company may see that there is some liability there and it heads off a suit further on down the line. If they can settle for, for medical expenses today, it's better than going to court with a $2 million suit six months from now or six years from now. You should not admit liability if something like that should happen on your floor. You should not even let that person know that you have liability insurance. You should give that person the phone number of your insurance company and let them take it up with your insurance company. That's very important. It is, it is detrimental to you and to our organization should you announce at a weekend or a festival that you have liability insurance because they will seek any way they can find to get part of that from you if they can. A lot of accidents, you did not make someone step on their corner's foot. Nothing that you called said, step on your partner's foot or step on your corner's foot. So the dancer has to assume a certain amount of liability by being in the square, by being in the hall. The basic coverage that you use your, your $2 million liability for is for someone who inadvertently walks through a glass door or is hurt by falling off the stage or someone knocks your speaker down and it falls off the stage and hits someone then there is clear liability on your part. You didn't secure your yak stack enough to keep it from falling off the table. Uh, you allowed dancers up on the stage that were able to bump your table and knock the equipment off and so forth. But you did not force man number one to step on lady number four's foot. So be very careful in admitting liability at a dance. The other part of your insurance policy with Caller Lab is the AD&D, Accidental Death and Dismemberment, and this is strictly a policy that gives you as a group, a group member of Caller Lab, some reimbursement should you be dismembered or accidentally die uh, as part of a square dance activity. It does not cover you while you're in your automobile going to or from a square dance. It covers you only at the dance. This would be effective in a case, again, of a, of a dancer knocking your, your, your equipment off the stage or knocking you off the stage and resulting in either death or a dismemberment of a hand, a foot, a loss of the, a sight of an eye, or something like that. The policy limits are not all that great. I think accidental death is like $5,000. But it's basically, it, it, it costs Caller Lab $2.50. For that coverage, actually, it costs you, the member, two dollars and fifty cents for that AD and D coverage. You paid this year with your dues eleven dollars for that two million dollars worth of liability coverage. So, all in all, it's a good deal. We cannot continue to keep that good deal if you admit liability for every accident, every one, every foot, every wrist, everything that happens during your dances. Because every time a claim is filed. The insurance company looks at that the next time it is due to renew your insurance and says, too many claims, we can't insure this group anymore, and so we have to go looking for another, another insurance carrier. So those are the two insurances that you have as a member of Color Lab and a resident of the U.S. That policy this year will be offered to Canadian callers as well as U.S. callers. The full-time callers committee has been working on obtaining health insurance benefits as well. You may see that as a caller lab benefit in the not too distant future. Certificates of insurance. There are two kinds of certificate of insurance. <clears throat> if you dance in a school or a, or a recreation center and the person that you are renting from, renting the hall from, asks for proof of coverage, a certificate of insurance is what you need. You can get that certificate by calling the insurance company. Use the 800 number that we publish in directions. Tell them you need a certificate of insurance. They'll type it up and mail it out that same day. 
There's another situation where a community hall or a church or a school will not rent you a facility at all unless you add them to the policy, and that's called a certificate of additional insured. In other words, the insurance company is not only insuring you as a caller, but they are insuring the, the school district or they're insuring the, the city rec department or they are insuring a church at the same time. You obtain that certificate the same way. You call the insurance company with the 800 number, tell them you need a certificate of, insur of, of additional insured issued to a school district 535 or whatever. In that case, the, our insurance company, A.H. Wallers and Company, will type up a certificate of additional insured and mail a copy of it to that park rec department or whatever. So in the, now if, if an accident occurs that, and that person sues the school or sues you, our insurance company is backing both of those suits. If you will please uh, come forth and put your voice on the tape here or, or give me your question clear, clear enough that I can repeat it. Uh, this will help the people that are buying these tapes. Uh, way in the back. Just a point. Oh, okay. Just a point to clear up. Um, when you speak of a hall, if there's a a warped floor or a, you know, in a parquet floor where there's a part of it that's loose and a dancer falls on that, are you liable or is the hall liable? Usually in that case, the hall is liable. The problem is the lawyers will sue the hall, they'll sue you, and they'll sue the manufacturer of the piece of parquet wood that came loose as well as the adhesive that was supposed to hold it down. So no one is safe in a suit such as that. It just gets spread uh, as, as far as the sue <laughs> can sue. Is it claims made or occurrence form? Because, is it claims made or occurrence form? Claims made meaning we must report right then because sometimes that claim is not sued for till next year. Claims are, are made through the same 800 number uh, to A.H. Wallers and Company, not through the Caller Lab office. You would call the insurance company to file a claim. What if, what if the claim that year, right you, then, don't you have a claim? The, the question was, does the caller need to make a report immediately? What if the suit does not actually occur until a year after the event or six months after the event? It's well in any case whether you think a suit will be filed or not for the caller to call that 800 number the Wolters company and make a report of what happened the problem with suits is that usually you don't find out about it until a year later and by then people have forgotten what's happened so you're, it would be correct for the caller at that point in time to call the insurance company and say we had an incident at our square dance last night and give them whatever information they ask for at that time the, uh policy states that it doesn't apply to an accident outside the area where the caller is calling. What's the definition of outside the area? The, the question, uh, he says the policy states that for the AD&D that the policy is not in effect outside the area of square dancing. The definition of that means if you're out in the parking lot, the coverage is no longer available. You are outside the area of where the square dancing takes place. So basically, it is the hall in which you dance. For $2.50, it's a very limited policy. Now, we, we, we may be adding to that. We have another company looking at our AD&D coverage that is making a proposal to increase that coverage to cover us in, in a lot broader sense than the, than the policy we have now for the same cost. Does that apply also to the dancers uh, in the hall only or to and from the car, the parking lot, should they slip on the ice? The, the question was, does the policy cover a dancer in the hall or do, would that cover a, a dancer that slips and falls on the ice in the parking lot? We're talking about two different policies here now. The first time we were talking about AD&D. &D. Now we are talking about liability in the case of a person slipping in the parking lot. And that should still be reported by you, and that, should, that still would be a case where that person might sue. And you might be named in it even though you had nothing to do with the maintenance of that sidewalk because you rented the facility for that night. You have to, uh, 
And you have to watch out for things like that as best you can. If you do your job of, of, of at least paying notice to it and telling them when they leave the hall, watch out, there are slippery spots, you've done all you can do. You've, done, you've made a fair share or fair effort to warn the people of that situation. The question is, are there a great number of claims filed on an annual basis? There were eight claims filed last year. Uh, now, from 3,500 people over a year's period of time, that is not a large number of claims. There was, of those eight claims, there was only one suit. The rest were settled, either settled out or, or it was proven that the, 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 there was no need to go to court because the person was not liable, the caller was not liable in that situation. Our Callers Association uh, sponsors dances as a part of the Callers Association, and uh, we, in that case, carry a liability policy. Is there any thought by Caller Lab to add associations to the, uh, uh, to the insurance policy for liability purposes? We added that coverage last year. Um, when you, as a car lab member, and your association have a bake sale or have a have a, um, a square dance or something that you sponsor, your insurance covers you, but the association is still uncovered at that point in time. If someone were to sue the officers of the association because of neglect of something or sue the association itself, our policy, as we are talking about so far today, does not cover that. Last year, Caller Lab made arrangements with our insurance carrier, A.H. Wollers & Company, that for a fee of $25, any Caller's Association who was, who was already an affiliate of Caller Lab, in other words, you paid your $60 dues to Caller Lab and became an affiliate member, then for 25 additional dollars, you could have a $2 million policy which covered the officers of the association and the association itself in, in a case of something like that happening. Thank you, George. I think that offers an awful lot of information and certainly gives an update of what kinds of insurance packages options are available through Caller Lab. Uh, if you get additional questions, please hold them till the end of the, the program and then we'll try to address them as time permits. At this point, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Roy Gatta and uh, we'll uh, delve into the area of bookkeeping. Okay, and just to preface this, this is by no means the definitive way to keep records. It's just some people have seen the way I do it and decided it was worth the presentation and might be something different than what you're doing. The computer stuff I'm going to show you, just so that you know, is I'm not a computer programmer. Oh, 2 o'clock, my chime just went off. <laughs> I, I'm not a computer programmer. I, I, I know nothing about that end of it. I buy software that is easy for me to understand, hopefully with as little reading as possible. Uh, occasionally I actually do read a manual, but I prefer not to. And uh, and I buy what I need, so I, it's not like I'm some sort of computer wizard. I don't do it for a living, okay? I teach algebra. So, yeah, I know some people are going, oh, no. So, um, yeah, we may as well get started. And, uh, oh, i got to turn this on, don't I? Oh, we don't want that. Oh, that's better. And I know it's probably a little difficult to see. Uh, this is designed for a classroom of high school students, not a theater setting. Describe as much detail as you can as yeah. what we're looking at for the table. Yeah, and uh, I'll be describing a lot of this, and it follows along with your handout. Um, in the record keeping outline, it says I use a database instead of a spreadsheet. What this alternative is, is the fact that there's a lot of financial programs out there you can buy, very elaborate ways to keep records, and they're fine programs. Uh, or you could use a spreadsheet that usually comes with any integrated software. This happens to be uh, Microsoft Works, which has uh, word processing, database, and spreadsheet all in one program. And this particular, um, I used the database instead of the spreadsheet, which is what most people do. And I started using a spreadsheet several years ago, and I switched to the database. Uh, spreadsheet is for number crunching. It allows you to multiply and divide and uh, basically grab you know, a cell here and a cell there and tell it to multiply them and divide them and stuff. Can't do that with a database, but I feel you don't need it for most of your records. One thing uh, a lot of the databases will do now is it will add columns. And really when you think about when you're doing your records, what do you do? You add up columns of numbers and that's about it. Okay? And this allows me to do that. Plus it gives me lots of other options which hopefully I can show you. 
So I'll start out and um, I'll just run you through what I have here and then we'll answer any questions. I have our records set up. You can see on the handout where I have the date of the event, the name of the event, income, miles, time, tolls, food, hotel, air, what else is on here? Fees, that would be like what I paid to get into a workshop or a dance, hall rent, refreshments, and the ever-present miscellaneous category. Okay? And I try to use that as little as possible. You can create any fields that you want, give them any names that you want, and you can usually create as many as like 250 categories uh, so you can cover anything you want. And I tend to keep it fairly simple. It takes you probably, uh, when you're first getting into this, maybe a couple hours to set this up. But then I come home every night after the dance, I turn this on, I enter the records, I shut it off. It takes me five minutes maximum. It took me about eight or nine months to actually really get into the routine. Oh, damn, didn't do the computer last night. Okay, now it's, it's routine, it's habit. All I have to do is I put in the date, I put in the name of the club, income, miles, and that's usually all I have. Sometimes there'll be some tolls, okay? And then I have a permanent record in the computer of what I did the day before. It's done. At the end of each month, I total it up. Here we have, okay, January totals, okay? Now, the computer will not do this for me in this program on the screen. What I have to do is I, when I print a report, okay, if I select a report here, okay, there's my report, okay, this tells me, okay, how I've set the report up. It tells me that, oh, it doesn't ratch, okay. Um, this, there's a category here which says sum the field. It means that when it prints it, when it prints the report for me, it totals everything up. See, this column is totaled from here up, okay? It's total. So then what I do is I simply add an extra line. Notice I put an asterisk here, okay? And then I go back on February 1st and I type in this total and this total and this total, okay? At the end of the year, tax time, okay? I can say, okay, let's see. I would like my totals. So I simply say, uh, date begins with that. Now the computer. Oh, rats. What did I do wrong? Oh, I see what I did. Duh. Sorry, I had something in there I forgot I had. Bingo. There's each monthly total. Okay. And then when I print the report, okay, if you look on the third page of your handout, you should see the, the screen that's in front of you that's up on here. But notice the printed thing has a total at the bottom. Okay? When it prints it out, there I have my total income, the mileage, the tolls, the food. Come, you know, I don't have to now go through and add up all those receipts. I don't have to go through the checkbook. Okay, I don't have to have all these napkins and credit card things laying around. I just enter those totals onto my tax form. Okay? Now, have I kept those receipts? Oh, yeah. But all I have to do is I know that when I come home, those receipts are in a file folder in the file cabinet, but I don't have to go through them again. They're all right here. Okay? Um, my taxes used to take me days. Okay? Now it's pretty much a one-day operation because this drudgery here is done. So, you know, with a database, I can change these fields at will. I can add them anytime I want. I can take them. If I don't like where it is, here, I'll move it over. There. Now it's over there. Okay? With a spreadsheet, you have a little more difficulty doing that. Okay? That's more designed for the more precise, regimented life of the accountant. Okay? Sorry, Greg. <laughs> and, uh, but it allows me to do that. The other thing it allows me to do which is one of my favorite things with a database, is if you look at the next sheet on your handout, suddenly a different thing has been printed. Notice it has the events lifted, listed alphabetically. Okay? Usually it, at the end of the year, the heck's my uh, outline? 
Okay, I can. Oh, let me switch to that here. No, I don't want to do that. Hang on, I almost just killed my program. Oh yes, you learn lots of new words that you say to your computer at times. Okay, they're they're, they're probably words you've used before, but they have all kinds of new applications. Okay, so, but uh, here I can take this, and now I can uh, sort this in one action. Boom. All my clubs are listed alphabetically. Why would I want to do that? Okay, well, and lessons. I don't want to have lessons on there. I just clutter it up. So let's change my selection here. Uh, let's get rid of that. No rules in effect. Event. Here we go. It does not contain. Okay, what I'm doing is, I, I'm. thanks, Greg. I should describe that. I decided I want the computer only to give me certain records. I don't want them to show me like my lessons because I know what I charged myself to, to do those. I don't want it to show me my regular clubs for this printout that I'm going to ask it to do. Okay. So now I have that alphabetical listing and notice there's no lessons listed on there anymore. There was back to, there was lessons here. That was a, a different night of the week. I keep this near the phone where I keep my calendar. Because I'm sure most of you are in a situation, okay, let's see, uh, uh, where are we at? Pick a club. Oh, Backtracks worked a lot for them. That's probably because it's our club. Okay, this group here in Baltimore called me up. And they want to hire Betsy for uh, whatever, October. And I'm going, oh, what did I charge them last year? Okay, and I know you all do that. Or, or there's another club in Baltimore calls us up. Oh, what did I charge the club that's three miles away from them? Okay, because you don't want to get yourself in an uncomfortable position. I have it all listed right here. Not only the club's name, what I charged them, the day of the date, other assorted information. One thing I've added, this is last year's um, information. What I've added this year is I've added the state, the location of where these clubs are so that I can group, okay, New York State, I did this, Pennsylvania, we did that. So that now, not only do I have all my tax records, but I have information that's valuable to me when it comes to booking these clubs. Club from Plattsburgh, New York calls us. Okay, what did we, that was North Country. What did we charge them? Okay, well, let's not get out of line with this new club that's called us. And let's face it, you have to do that um, as far as uh, avoiding uh, conflict, not only between you and the clubs, but between clubs in the area. Okay, so I keep that. Let me go back to, uh, let me show all the records. And I want this sorted. And you can see what I'm showing you here. I'm going through the computer. Once again, I can arrange this any way I want. Now my January totals are at the top. Actually, all my totals are at their beginning. And then I start with January again. So with a database, you can select like any records that you want. For instance, I'm sure this does not happen to any of you, but my wife comes home from the dance. Oh, thank you, dear. Did you get the mileage? Oh, I forgot to write it down. Okay, well, we did that club last year, so I can say, okay, that was Pelham Promenaders, wasn't it? So I'll go into my computer, and I'll ask the computer to dig up uh, event contains, I'm trying to type here with one hand the old way, I spelled it wrong, Pelham, okay, bingo, that's what we did for them last year. Whoa, how do we get away with not getting paid for that one? Okay. So in other words, you have, oh, I don't want to do that. You have reference to go back to because you don't always remember to take all your records. And the IRS, by the way, loves these sort of things. You know, they show some sort of systematic record keeping. They show that you're organized. They will believe these things, especially if you have most of the receipts. And they'll say, well, wait a minute, you made $140 for that one. Why did you not make any money for that one? Well, it was a Toys for Tots. It was a charity thing. Oh, okay, a charity thing. Well, that's even better for you with the IRS. So you could document everything you did, and if you have most of your receipts, the IRS will be very happy with you. We've been audited four times. We know. Okay. I have one more thing I want to uh, show you, and it, it's not on the computer um, because I forgot to load it. But um, you have two more sheets uh, on that we gave you. And the uh, how we keep records for our various clubs. You see one that says club at the top, and there's no club filled in. 
and there's another one right behind it which says the same thing but there's a club filled in I have a separate thing in my computer I made up a, a blank form which is like the blank one you have there the club the starting time the time it took to get there now you probably all have that type of thing in a file folder somewhere you know with your clubs but how many times do you take it out to take it to a dance and now it's under the car seat someplace okay this way I have my copy in the computer with directions the time it takes to get there who the contacts are the phone numbers sure I want the hard copy with me and I keep this in a file folder but we lose these things with the computer and with backup disks for when your computer fails and these things wear out they're electronic they wear out eventually usually at the absolute most inopportune time okay but keep all your records backed up okay so and we simply use this I got about three minutes to wrap up here uh, I want to talk briefly about calendars okay we love these things these little pocket electronic digital calendars I carry one Betsy carries one this is not our official calendar but it's a lot less cumbersome than this one which hangs on the refrigerator next to the phone we this is very unusual this almost never leaves our house okay this is the official calendar okay but we can carry these in my pocket my briefcase purse okay people say are you available for a certain date let me check it looks good but I have to go home and confirm it with the official calendar we personally never take a booking while we're on the road okay or at a dance we'll say looks good we'll take a tentative date I'll call you tomorrow with the confirmation this way we don't double book we did that once in, in 20 years we've been together and it just doesn't work how expensive are these okay good question this cost me ninety dollars that's all it has a calendar which goes up through the year 2099 so I think I'll probably not out use this count I can keep it has a 64 K memory I keep about 120 phone numbers in it I keep uh, memos uh, to myself like phone card credit numbers uh, I keep a password on that so people can't get to it all my dates the schedules what we're charging who to contact it's all in this it's a nice little item when you're on the road too, to keep all that information with you okay uh, that's all I had thank you Roy for that portion of the program on the bookkeeping we're gonna move now into an area federal income taxes if you are not in an appropriate seat where you can see the screen, I welcome you to go ahead and, and move. Federal income taxes for the caller. There are many things that are of a technical nature that your current accountant, if you have one, or an IRS agent, should you ever be audited, may not be aware of that are very specific to the square dance calling field and the caller. And just to get started, it, perhaps you've seen this Lockhorn's cartoon. It shows Mr. and Mrs. Lockhorn at the front door being greeted by the IRS agent. And because of the time of the year, he's telling them the season to be jolly is over. And that's quite true. Sometimes we get all uptight about these things. and But we're here to get you unwound, to get you calmed down, because you're going to be more knowledgeable when you leave here today. One of the terms that you often hear about when talking about... Um, square dance calling or other professions like ours is the terminology for hobby loss. A hobby loss is nothing more than a section of the Internal Revenue Service regulations that says is what you are doing a hobby or is it a business? If it's a hobby you may not have a loss deducted on your tax return. It's as simple as that. Hobby, no loss. If it's a business, losses are permitted. So it becomes very critical to know whether or not this caller who is calling the programs is really in it as a hobby or if he's really in it for a business. And there are some determining factors that the IRS would look to to determine whether or not it is a hobby or a business. There's something called the presumption of a profit motive. And that's what they look at. There are many points in the area of presumption of a profit motive that the IRS would look at. 
actual profits in three of five years. If over a five-year period of time, you've actually shown a profit on your Schedule C in three of those years, then that's a pretty good indication that you're a business and not a hobby. Therefore, those years that you had losses would be deductible losses because you were a business, not a hobby. Accurate books and records that Roy was just speaking of, that kind of a system shows that you are operating like a business. That is a good point in your favor. Expertise of the taxpayer, or the caller in this case. Time and effort expended. How much time do you spend doing the dances, preparing for the dances, studying for the dances, attending training sessions, etc.? History of losses after a startup period. If I started calling 30 years ago, and then I had 29 years of losses and one year of income last year, that's not a very good history of losses after the startup period. I might be in jeopardy of deducting those losses on a tax return. The amount of an occasional profit. How big is it? Did you have $10,000 losses for four years and then a $4 profit? So that, that enters into the picture too. Is it a primary source of income? That doesn't mean that to qualify as a business that it must be, but that is just one of these many factors that they look at in the whole area of hobby loss rules. And the elements of personal pleasure. Frankly, I don't understand that when it makes it sound like if you enjoy it, then it must not be a business. I, I've never comprehended that, but I put it on the list just because it is an item that, that gets considered. Uh, this is an IRS form number 5213, and we don't even need to remember it, but I just found it fascinating. In the whole area of hobby losses, if you are new to the business and you haven't had that five-year period to determine whether or not you've had profits in three or five years and the IRS wants to do an audit, you can postpone the audit. And again, you will probably never use this form, but the title just slays me. This is, I think, the longest title IRS form I've ever seen. Election to postpone determination as to whether the presumption that an activity is engaged in for profit applies. Heck of a form. What a deal. In the area of sound equipment, tape recorders, wireless microphones, all this equipment, there's more than one way that you can record an expense for that on your tax return. One of them is called a Section 179 deduction, named after Code Section 179 of the Internal Revenue Code. The Section 179 deduction is used to expense the equipment in the year you bought it. You buy a $2,000 used amplifier, you take a deduction on your Schedule C for the amplifier, bam, all in one year. It has a limit. You may not deduct more than $10,000 in that year or your net income on your Schedule C. But it may not be a good strategy depending on the circumstances. An example, sound equipment, as you know, is expensive. If you are making marginal profits, it may not make sense to deduct the sound equipment in the year you buy it, thereby ensuring a loss, thereby increasing the odds of being audited on your tax return. Well, how else can you take care of it? You can use something called depreciation. Depreciation is nothing more than taking the cost of your equipment, like an amplifier, dividing that cost up into more than one year, depreciating it or expensing a portion each year. How long a period of time do you use and what methods of depreciation? Two of the buzzwords that you hear when you start talking about depreciation are straight line and accelerated. Straight line depreciation as a concept is basically taking the cost of that equipment, dividing it into equal parts, and taking that equal part each year over, let's say, a five-year period of time. Accelerated depreciation is nothing more than getting a higher deduction in the earlier years a lower deduction in the later years. That's all those terms mean. Straight line, pretty even deduction for five years. Accelerated, higher deductions in the earlier years, lower deductions in the later years. Total deduction over the life of the asset is still the same. If it was a $3,000 amplifier, that's still what you're going to deduct on your tax return Schedule C over the life of the asset. More specifically, 
And we won't dwell on this a lot because there is a lot of detailed information available in your 1040 forms packet. There are publications available, which we'll talk about later, that get into the actual formulas for depreciation. There's also an example in your handout that gives an example of, I believe, a $3,000 asset. What is the depreciation per year? This example shows over a six-year period of time what the accelerated depreciation is and what the straight line depreciation is. You will notice, and let me talk about straight line first, I've got an amount in the first year and in the last year that is one half of the amount in the middle years. That is because whether you are using straight line or whether you're using an accelerated form of depreciation, the IRS regulations say in the first year you only deduct half of the normal depreciation dollars. Don't worry about remembering that. There will not be a test on it. There are tables in the booklets that will tell you exactly what amount. But basically, they, they assume what is called a mid-year convention. They assume that you bought that asset in the middle of the year. Instead of knowing, did you buy it April 15th? Did you buy it November 30th? They just assume a half year. The initials, again, you don't have to remember these, but the accelerated depreciation method currently in use is MACRS, Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. But you don't need to remember that. It's in the book. The tables are there. I like to think about after-tax cost, whether it be after-tax cost of equipment, after-tax cost of coming to the Caller Lab convention, or whatever. After-tax cost is nothing more than a concept which allows us to rationalize buying all these neat things. <laughs> but it does have a practical side to it also. If you buy a piece of equipment for whatever the amount of money is, and you either expense it under Section 179 or you take depreciation over a few years' period of time, that piece of equipment didn't cost you $3,000. You saved some income taxes, did you not, in your Schedule C as a business. The income taxes you save when subtracted from the cost gives you what I call, or what is commonly referred to as the after-tax cost. Okay, let's say you got a $3,000 asset, and for simplicity's sake, let's say that one-third of all your income, one-third of all your expenses, you're in about the 33% counting federal and state income taxes. So for simplicity's sake, one-third saving in taxes. $3,000 asset, you do not have to pay $1,000 in taxes because you deducted that as a business expense, so it costs you $2,000, not $3,000 in this very simplified example. That's all we mean by after-tax cost. It's a way to actually have the government, which is ultimately us, but it's a way to have the government subsidize trips, education, equipment, etc. Computers, and this goes back to what Roy was doing on record keeping. You are permitted to depreciate the business portion of a computer that's used for the business. You must keep a log of the business use versus the personal use. Obviously, it's convenient to keep the log right on the computer. In the database, if you have a database, it would be an excellent way to do it. I personally do not take a deduction for use of a home computer. I've got a teenage son who is a computer guru. He knows much more about it than I do. He spends countless hours on the computer compared to my few minutes. There is no way I could justify a business deduction. I don't even bother. But if you have a computer that is used significantly for a business, you are permitted to deduct the business portion verified by a log. One caution I would make, the use of computers in businesses like this is a new enough phenomenon, even though it's been around for a few years, that there are not a sufficient number of court cases that have tested the different issues involved. The lack of court cases just means we don't know quite as much about the legitimacy and the problems of deducting computer costs as we might otherwise. So that is a cautionary area. Automobile expenses for travel. 
this is a good thing to, to look at, and there are a couple of ways that this can be approached. The easiest by far is what is called the standard mileage deduction. You travel a thousand miles this year, you are allowed a deduction of 28 cents per mile times that thousand miles gives you your $280 deduction on the Schedule C for your mileage, for your automobile expenses. You may be told by an accountant that commuting costs are not deductible on the tax return. One of our full-time traveling callers had attended my session a few years ago when I talked about the mileage deduction. He says, well, wait a minute. My accountant says I can't deduct commuting costs. In the area of a self-employed individual, such as a square dance caller, going from your home to the dance is not a commuting cost in the normal sense of the terms. It is deductible. He went back, talked to his accountant. The accountant did not want to, but did amend the tax return. He got a $1,300 tax refund. Let's turn the tape over now for the continuation of the program. So sometimes the tax accountants who may be working with you are not sufficiently well versed on the particular nature of the square dance calling business. So that is a consideration too. In order to support your deduction for mileage, Roy showed you the database where he had a column opposite the date that he recorded the mileage. At the end of the year, he knows what the total mileage is times 28 cents. He knows what the deduction is. If you don't have a computer database, a diary in which you record the mileage will be sufficient, but it must be what they call a contemporaneous log, not something that a week before you're going to get audited by the IRS, you go back and fill in a whole bunch of pages as to what mileage you had. There is another way besides the standard mileage deduction. We can look at actual costs, whether or not the IRS standard mileage deduction is higher or lower than actual cost you don't know unless you have appropriate records that will explain that. In the area of actual costs, though, we have some limitations. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this will merely generate some questions in your particular situation. I just want you to be aware of the situations so that later on, if that situation applies to you, you can go investigate it. When you deduct actual costs for the car, you are deducting depreciation, gas, oil, repairs, license plates, all the things that are associated with operating that vehicle. Insurance, that's a big item too. But there are some limits imposed on depreciation deduction, and it's all in the realm of luxury cars. Several years ago, the IRS imposed the limits on the amount or a cap on the amount of depreciation for an automobile that could be deducted for business purposes. They didn't like the thought of taxpayers having Rolls Royces taking humongous depreciation deductions, so they say, we've got limits for luxury car depreciation. This BMW is a luxury car. I don't think any of us would doubt that. But ah, even in the IRS regulations, this Chevrolet Nova is a luxury car. It is because of its cost. And there is a table in your handout, and again, we don't need to memorize this now, but just be aware, generally in about the area of thirteen, fourteen thousand dollar $14,000 cost for a vehicle, because of the depreciation limits, that throws it into the category of a luxury car. What happens when you depreciate a luxury car? They say you can only deduct so many dollars the first year, so many dollars the second year, the third year, etc. Instead of having an asset, a vehicle that's going to be depreciated over five years, you've now got a vehicle that's going to be depreciated over seven, eight, nine, ten years, depending on how long you have it. So suffice it to say that there are just limits as to the maximum amount of depreciation that you can deduct in one year. An example of the way to calculate the deduction if you're doing actual costs. We figure out whatever method we use, whether it's straight line or that accelerated method, the amount of depreciation that we're going to take in the year, what our gas and maintenance costs were, tires, supplies, insurance, other items. We get a total for the whole year. 
we know what our total mileage was for the year because on January 1, we very dutifully wrote down the odometer reading, didn't we? And December 31, we did the same thing. We know the total mileage for the year. So therefore... And we also, in our diary, we know what the business miles is. In this particular example, I've got a very high business use, almost 100%. That percentage times the total cost, that's my business deduction for automobile expense that goes on my Schedule C. Now, what are some of the advantages or disadvantages of using a detailed actual expense versus the 28 cents per mile? 28 cents per mile is obviously easier to substantiate. You've got a diary entry times the mileage rate, which can change from year to year, but for both 92 and 93 it is 28 cents. So it's very easy. You can get a higher deduction, though, on your tax return by using actual costs, depending how expensive is the car, how many miles do you drive. I don't put that many miles on a car. I've got a car that I reserve just for score dance calling, so that my usage is quite high. With low miles, high usage, the cents per mile of depreciation gets quite high. I'll say that one more time, but I will, then we'll go on. But if you have X dollars, in this example, 1,330, whether you drive it 10 miles or 10,000 miles in that year or 100,000 miles, the depreciation dollars are the same. Divide the pre depreciation dollars by how many miles you went. If you had a lot of miles, there wasn't much depreciation per mile. If you had low miles, there is a greater depreciation per mile. And I believe I included an example in the handout that shows different scenarios where, depending on how many miles and how expensive the car, it could help you decide whether you want to use actual expenses or a standard mileage rate. Another thing that we need to look at, and we don't, again, need to memorize the approach, but it's the area called basis adjustment. You just need to be aware of it. If you've got a business vehicle, you use it for a few years, you trade it in or sell it, you buy another business vehicle, you cannot just take the new cost of that business vehicle and start depreciating it. You must recognize whether or not you had a gain or loss on the old vehicle and take that into account. Very briefly, in this example, originally cost $15,000, 14000 in depreciation. That means its basis, or what it's worth now on your record, is $1,000. But you sold it for $1,500. You made a $500 profit. You cannot ignore that. Then you turn around and you buy a new vehicle for $18,000. You don't depreciate the $15,000. You subtract that gain. It's a kind of a rolling transaction where that vehicle that was disposed of does affect the depreciation that you're going to claim at a later date. Again, the IRS instructions, there's a handbook on automobiles, it talks about all these kinds of things, walks you through different examples on how to calculate it. Meals. Meals are another thing that are deductible. Meals, as a business expense, used to be 100% deductible. No more. The IRS changed the law and said that now your meal deductions is limited to 80% of the meal. In other words, 20% of what you spend for meals and entertainment is not a deductible expense for business purposes. Most, and I should have asked George this question earlier, but most of your convention fee is for meals. Only 80% of that fee is deductible. And there is an appropriate line on the Schedule C in the right-hand column for you to, first of all, show the total meals and entertainment, remove 20% of that, and then deduct the remaining 80%. Now, what is a valid meal expense? A valid meal expense, I'm getting a little ahead of myself on that slide, a valid meal expense requires an overnight stay. If I hop in my car in Colorado Springs, drive 70 miles north, do a dance in Denver, have dinner in Denver before the dance, drive home that night, no overnight stay, no meal deduction. That was a personal expense. If I drive to Denver for a weekend festival, stay one or two nights in a motel, 
the meals that I buy while I'm gone on the trip, that is a valid meal expense and is deductible. I drive to Denver. I, I buy a meal. I stay at the dance. I drive partway home. I get a little sleepy. I pull off on the side of the road, take a snooze for a couple hours, drive home. That is not a deductible expense. I was not away from home overnight. Um, tell you what, George, I know you have a question. Would you jot it down and we'll come back to that? Uh, and any of you, if you have questions, go ahead and jot it down and we will take them in a moment. For those who do a lot of traveling, there is something called per diem allowance. I do not use per diem allowance. I don't have that much meal expense. But a per diem allowance, if you're doing a lot of traveling, is kind of like the standard mileage deduction for cars. A per diem allowance for meals and incidentals, you don't have to keep all the receipts. You can deduct expenses as low as $26 per day or as high as $34 per day. I had this slide made up and then in March there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, the IRS has changed these rates. There used to be two rates, I believe there are four rates now, so this information already is out of date. The range is because there are high cost areas in the country, there are low cost areas. Uh, traveling in the New York City area is not going to be as expensive as Castle Rock, Colorado, so there are different rates used for different areas. But suffice it to say that if you do a lot of traveling, it might be convenient for you to use a per diem allowance instead of actually keeping the receipts. But be aware, the day is divided into six-hour increments, four six-hour increments. So if you are away from home, if you're using the per diem allowance and you're away from home for one six-hour increment and not the other three six-hour increments, you only get one-fourth of the per diem allowance. So that's something that you have to take into account. But like I say, most people I don't believe utilize the per diem. It's mainly the full-time traveling callers, I suspect, that are using that. Home office deductions. This, this looks like your home office, right? A home office deduction, the Supreme Court has recently had a decision, and this was from a January 13th edition of the Wall Street Journal, how the Supreme Court's home office ruling affects you. It's virtually impossible for a square dance caller to now deduct the expenses of an office in the home. Virtually impossible. The ruling of the Supreme Court used wording such as it must be a taxpayer's most important place of business. There's no way in most cases that we could say our home is a square dance caller's most important place of business. It's the square dance hall. I suspect that if a caller or cure had a dance hall built as part of his home, there might be room for a home office deduction in conjunction with the hall. That has not been tested in the courts, but the Supreme Court case was very emphatic. It had, I believe it was an anesthesiologist who made rounds of different hospitals, had an office in the home that spent as much as three hours a day keeping records. It was his only office because his rounds were made at hospitals. Sorry, no deduction. It was that strict. So you might as well give up on a deduction in the home office unless you have most peculiar situation. The language also talked about the relative importance of the activities performed at each location and the time spent at each place. And again, in the case of this doctor, three hours a day spent at your home, sorry, no deduction. So basically forget about it. They, they put out a booklet on uh, publication 587 on business use of your home that's basically going to have to be rewritten as a result of this Supreme Court decision because much of the information contained in there is now no longer valid. Other deductions, and Roy had some of these shown in different columns on his database. We'll just briefly run down them. You can look at the list. Equipment repairs, insurance, records and tapes. Uh, I've got supplies for office and equipment. Even though you cannot take a home office deduction, in other words, depreciation, a portion of depreciation in your home, a portion of utilities, you can't take that. But the office supplies that are very much a part of your business, that's still okay. Airfare, hotel, all the various types of travel expenses, 
caller and spouse, dues, publications, licenses, club expense. If you have a caller run club, for that caller run club, you incur advertising expenses, you go out buy coffee, cups, sugar, etc. You have other kinds of promotional expenses. Uh, you hire a caller to fill in for you while you're gone. You hire a cure. All of those expenses that relate to that caller operated club are deductible expenses. Telephone. Telephone is an area. The basic service to your home is not a deductible expense. If you had add certain options, you may be able to deduct those options. For example, if you have a basic line in your home and then add a second line just for business use, you may be able to deduct that line. In my case, I've got a telephone line. We recently installed a separate phone line for my son. He still has his phone. I have my phone. That's not an extra line added for business purposes. Even though it gets him off my phone, so I'm more likely not to miss calls, it's still not a business telephone line, so I cannot deduct that. Long distance calls are deductible. Also, the taxes. Your phone bill is going to have somewhere at the bottom of the bill federal taxes and maybe regional taxes also. If you want to take the time to figure out what the percent is and then add that portion of taxes to your long distance charges, that just gets a few more coins out of the IRS, so why not? It's legitimate. Costumes. In the area of costumes, oh goodness, he forgot his. In the area of costumes, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because something is expensive that it's tax deductible. The basic IRS guidelines indicate that for costume to be deductible, it generally cannot be suitable for other wear. It becomes a little marginal when you talk about a square dance caller. It's definitely not marginal when you've got a woman caller who has petticoats, dresses, etc., that would not be worn when she goes shopping at Walgreens. I mean, that's a very clear cut deductible situation. It's not in my opinion, a controversy when the caller's spouse costume gets deducted because it is a team activity, a partner activity. So if you have a gray area, though, in interpreting income tax law, I do not think it inappropriate to be aggressive. I deduct all of my costumes, but I don't wear my $250 lizard boots anywhere but calling dances. After several years when they're worn out, I might wear them somewhere else. But I, I keep my clothes. They're in a separate closet. I don't wear them other than when I'm calling. The vests, the buckles, etc. So I take a deduction for the costume. But it is a gray area and just be aware of that. One of the key points about taxation it is legal to avoid taxes, and we have learned this afternoon how to properly avoid taxes, but it, it is illegal to evade taxes, and there is a distinction there. If you evade rather than avoid, you can end up like our poor friend here in the clinker and have lots of problems. But don't be concerned with... Uh, or let me rephrase that. Go ahead and if something seems to be a valid business deduction, go ahead and take the write-off for it. As far as records retention, generally receipts that are associated with your business should be kept for a minimum of three years period of time, and that's three years from the date you filed your tax return. So if you got an extension to file your tax return, that could prolong the waiting period from the normal April 15th due date. Documents like the tax return itself, I just keep them indefinitely. I mean, it's only a few pages. It's easy to keep. I've got it as a source of information if I'm going to need it. Any kind of record that is associated with, for example, your amplifier, way back when I started calling, I was depreciating an amplifier over a 10-year period of time. It was important for me to keep the receipt for the purchase of that amplifier for the entire period that I owned and was depreciating that asset. 
So that was an example when the three-year period for receipts would not apply because I've still got an asset that has a continuing useful life that I'm depreciating it over. Very quickly in some other areas that we might look into, Social Security tax or self-employment tax on your Schedule C. If you're in business for yourself, and unless you have exceeded the FICA tax limit through other employment, you must pay self-employment taxes on your net square dance income. If you had $5,000 of revenue, $4,500 of expenses, you got a $500 net income, you must pay self-employment tax on that $500 of net income. That tax is calculated on a Schedule SE of the Form 1040. Schedule SE of the Form 1040 is used for self-employment tax. It is very expensive tax, but it is required. I believe it is approximately 15% of your net income. 15.3. It is, I believe, a three-stage formula because they do allow a part of the tax to be deducted in computing the tax itself. But when you consider that you are not only paying income tax, in most cases federal and state, on that $500, but you are also paying self-employment tax on that $500. You're talking about a pretty steep tax rate on your square dance income. And this gets into, this reminds me of an area, you call it ethics, you call it uh, whatever your, your own personal makeup is. We all know callers who do not report income that's their problem. It used to bug me, and in a way I guess it still bugs me as a taxpayer because if I'm carrying my fair share of paying for the roads, etc., then it bothers me if someone else doesn't. But I sleep nights, I report all my income, all my expenses, and you don't really want to get in the position of trying to judge someone else on this. It's my job to here to present information and let you utilize it to the full ex extent you can for your benefit without trying to make judgments as to whether these people are deducting things properly and these people aren't even reporting it. That's up to you as an individual. Um, if you do not have a regular paycheck with withholding, you may be required to make periodic deposits to the government for estimated income tax. That's done on a 1040 ES. So if you are not making regular withholding payments through a wage from an employer, you need to investigate the possibilities of making quarterly estimated tax payments from your income. Here's a formula. We don't need to really memorize the formula other than to know that if you would like to have a retirement plan set up for your square dance income, it is permitted. It's called a Keogh plan or there are variations called a SEP plan. This allows you to deduct on your tax return a portion of your net square dance income. Approximately 15%, but in many cases it works down to closer to 13% because of a long formula that it goes through. I've got a Keogh plan. I don't get to put much money into it because the square dance income isn't that high, but over enough years, if you plunk away funds, then it builds toward your retirement. You set up, a, let's say, a, an account at a bank, much like you would for an in, uh, individual retirement account. Each year, you calculate your net income from square dance calling. You go through a formula, and the formula is contained in the 1040 handbook. You come up with how many dollars you want to put into that plan. You fund that plan, or you actually write a check to the bank, to your account, and you take a de tax deduction for that amount. You're de de deducting it now. When you take the money out at retirement, that's when you'll pay income tax on it at that time. So it's an option. It's available. So just check in the, in the details if you want to. There are many pamphlets that the IRS puts out, pamphlets and publications that are available that will answer questions. There's also a fairly new IRS teletax number, which has an 800 number with more than 100 topics on different areas. There is a listing in the back of my Form 1040 package, so I presume you have one too, that lists topics, I believe, in alphabetical order. If there's an area that I glossed over today, if you don't call me, look up in the book, find out what the topic is, the number, you press the buttons on your touchtone phone, it gives you a recorded message on that particular area. At this time, we'll turn the 
lights back on and I know George had a question and some of you others may have questions too. If at all possible, uh, if you've got a question, go ahead and wander down toward the front and take any of the empty seats because we very definitely want to get this on tape so that the people who are listening to this later will be able to hear the question. George, do you still have what your question was earlier? Uh, it wasn't a question, Greg. It was a statement clarifying the meal expense. If you drove to Denver and called a festival weekend, were on your way home back on Sunday with you and your wife, and you got to Castle Rock and the local restaurant was closed, so you continued on to Colorado Springs. It's now 6 o'clock. Carol doesn't want to cook supper, so you stop in the local restaurant and eat a $25 meal. That is not deductible if you eat your meal in your hometown. I don't have a problem with that, that interpretation. Uh, is it... I had I had thought or considered the uh, fact that you use your car close to 100%, then the depreciation is still deductible at 100%. Is that true or not true? You're saying if you use your car 100% for square dance calling, is 100% of that normal year's allowance for depreciation deductible? No, it's 98%. Oh, then 98% of the depreciation is deductible. In other words, when you take actual costs, depreciation is just one of the costs. At the end of the year, I got a sheet of paper, or in my case a spreadsheet, it shows depreciation for that car, for all of that car, for one year, whatever the number may be, and then all of the other costs, fuel, taxes, insurance, tires. I get a grand total for the year of the entire expense for that automobile. Then I look at my diary and say, what percent did I use it for business? If it was 98%? Isn't, isn't there a number, though, where close to, 90, close to 100% where it... Isn't there a number close to 100% where the IRS considers it 100% use? Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a wishy-washy answer on that. But I, I'm specific. I mean, if it came out 98%, I'd probably use 98%. I have heard cases where a deduction was claimed... And for an expensive item like a motorhome and only a 50% deduction was claimed and the taxpayer didn't keep really good records and his accountant actually said, well, 50% looks a little phony. If you put 70%, they would probably think that was more legitimate and pass it. Now, this was a case where he didn't keep that good of records of how much he used it. So, But it shows that there is some flexibility in the thinking and it also depends on which IRS agent you should draw on an audit. You can get the same fact situation presented to more than one agent and get a different result from that audit. But having the ground rules laid, having good records like Roy was talking about, being as informed as possible will help you slide through an audit much easier than if you didn't have those things. Also, these little handouts, because IRS agents oftentimes and accountants oftentimes don't really understand the facets of the calling profession, by having information like the handouts you've received today in your permanent file, it gives more credence to this being a business. And it also, hopefully, clearly states what the different types of things legitimate expenses are for your, uh, your business. Any other questions? Bob Jones, Troy, Ohio. How do you approach this lady uh, for tips? You say uh, get receipts. Now, this is kind of tacky. You walk in a restaurant and say, give me a tip for your receipts or the bellhopper that brought my clothes in here. In a restaurant, oftentimes, automatically, they will tear off the bottom of the receipt and give it to you at the end of the meal. It will only show the total for the meal. You go ahead yourself and write in the amount of the tip that you left so that you've got the total. That's perfectly sufficient and adequate record keeping. That covers that. Like the bell hump. Bell hump. Before I left Colorado Springs a few days ago, I looked at my wallet. I wrote down how much cash I had in my wallet. When I get back, I'm going to do the same thing. Hopefully, the days I've been here... I've either been keeping receipts when I buy records at the exhibitors or I've been writing down notes. But if I haven't, I at least know when I get home how much I spent. And I know I didn't go on a vacation during that time because I came on business, I went home at the end of the business, 
So I will then write down a summary when I get home of while I was at Colorado, I spent this, 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 and this. And I've got a total for the convention that was spent in cash. Obviously, anything I charge is going to come through on my visa bill later. And then when I pay that, that will be entered into whatever record keeping I use. Oh, let me mention real quickly on record keeping. Besides a database, if you indeed want a software accounting package, there are many available. There was an article, and I'll refer you to the library. There was an article written in the February 1992 issue of PC Computing Magazine. That was February 92. PC Computing that reviewed 11 accounting systems priced at less than $300. So there's many available out there. If you've got a PC and you want something different than a database, there are certainly other options available. Can I take a swing at that last hour? Virgil Forbes from Maryland. Uh, among my military duties, I'm tax advisor for my command and have been gone through IRS courses for the last six years. On tips in conjunction with travel, tips in conjunction with meals, if you have a meal receipt, IRS will not question an extra 15% period as long as you have the documentation for the meal. If you are staying in a hotel motel, or any kind of travel mode. IRS, it depends on the auditor. And frankly, 95% of the auditors are very nice people, and the other 5% are not so nice people. Those 5% give the other 95% plenty of fear to work with. <laughs> don't, don't we all wish? But essentially, if you're they will take what they call reasonable undocumented expenses, meaning tips. Uh, most of them do not get carried away with it. If you're staying in a hotel like here and you say $5 a day in bellhop tips, they are not going to question it. Okay, I have a question. Actually, it's kind of two questions, both dealing with meal expenses. Uh, on the convention fee, it's my understanding that since Caller Lab does not give us a detailed breakdown of what the convention fee goes for, the entire convention fee is deductible. There's no breakdown on the 80%. That's my understanding. I wouldn't want to test it in a court of law. I wouldn't either. I, you know, it's a minor cost, really. When you get the total tax return, it's comparatively speaking, it's not that much. I personally exclude part of that but I you're right it has not been stated definitely that X dollars is if if you feel more comfortable that you should be eliminating part of it then say go ahead and make a determination on your own and write down a note here's my color lab fee I'm assuming that X percent was for meals so therefore I'll be real honest I'll exclude 20 percent of that so there's some gray area here but um, and that was, a, that was a change in the law, by the way, not too long ago. It hasn't been very many years since that elimination was put into the law. So it's a fairly new thing that we're dealing with. In doing a vehicle deduction, uh, obviously I don't want to mess with all the stuff on the car. I want to take the straight 28 cents. How detailed do I have to be in filling out the back of the depreciation form where it asks you all those questions about, uh, you know, the personal use of the vehicles and all of that sort of thing, and then the commuting miles and all that? Do I have to fill in all of that, just check the blocks? What do I need to do? Oftentimes, the IRS will allow you to substitute a suitable replacement for their forms. I never used the back of that form that shows all that detail. When I was claiming standard mileage rate, I had my diary, so I knew I could prove the, the mileage. I just had a schedule that I showed X thousands of miles at 28 cents per mile. This is my deduction. It has never been questioned. I have two questions. One is on the retirement uh, plan. If you already take out an IRA of $2,000 a year, can you still set up this retirement plan? And the other one is uh, on the mileage. Uh, I only call the local clubs right now, so I basically know every week the same mileage. Do I have to record it the, as a diary? Okay. The first question, you are permitted to have a retirement plan, a kilo plan as a caller, even if you have another pension plan like an IRA. 
what he's alluding to is there are some restrictions if you have, like I've got a profit sharing plan and a 401k plan at work. I am limited as to whether or not I can have an IRA for that reason. But in the case of the Kilo plan for the self-employed, no limitation. On your other question about going to the same dance halls week after week, how specific do you need? You still need a diary entry of some kind, whether the diary is a calendar book, whether it's an entry in your checkbook when you deposited the check and, and right beside it you wrote what the mileage was, an entry for each event that you went to. That's not saying you have to write down the beginning odometer and the ending odometer. If you know that it's 32 miles, that's sufficient to write 32 miles. But every week when you call at that hall, make an entry for 32 miles for the date that you had that mileage recorded. Bud Garrett, California. And Greg, you did a particularly fine job of making that presentation. It was very good. I think it'd be worth mentioning to the, all the folks that have leased vehicles that you don't have the option of using the standard mileage rate. Have to use actual mileage. Also, if you are using actual cost, I'm glad you said that, but if you are using actual cost on your vehicle, and if in that actual cost you are using the accelerated method of depreciation, you may not later go to standard mileage rate. So there are some restrictions and, and some rules. I don't want to get too complicated, but merely know that there are publications available that will provide you with additional information on that. Doris Palman, uh, Wisconsin. For George, um, there was some discussion yesterday or last night about um, our ASCAP and BMI licensing on callers that go out into a hall and do strictly country western dancing. Is their BMI and ASCAP cover them on that through Caller Lab? Right now, today, at this moment, that is not covered under our BMI and ASCAP agreement. Our agreement specifically states square dance related activities. No one, including the NEC, the NSDC, USDA, or any of the national organizations or international organizations have made the statement country western and line dancing is part of the square dance activity. So therefore it's excluded. Now at such time as some dancer organization or some leadership organization in the world of square dancing will say we accept country western, no, Texas two-step, country western dancing, line dancing as part of the overall square dance activity, then it would be covered. We will be taking steps in our Wednesday Board of Governors meeting to address that issue. Round the Lab has already addressed it. They have agreed to take country western dancing under their wing and at least provide written documentation of the steps and the basic movements of the country western dance. Collar Lab has not yet made line dancing or country western dancing a part of our square dance activity. We do still have a couple more questions, but I wanted to share this last cartoon with you before we do. I, I like Shu, the cartoon with the birds, and I thought this one, if you're worried about paying too much income tax, and it shows him sitting at his roll top desk working on it, get into a good tax shelter and wait till April 15th blows over, and it shows him hiding inside his desk with a roll top down. <laughs> yes, we got one question. I know we had a question when I was walking around. We had a question about is there a limit as to the maximum miles that you can deduct per year? There used to be. There used to be a restriction that when you got over so many miles per year, you reverted from the 28 cents per mile down to 11 cents per mile. That restriction has been lifted. So the 28 cents per mile applies to all business miles driven during the year. No matter, now, no matter how many miles on the vehicle, but when you go trade at that basis adjustment we were talking about, if you claim standard mileage deduction, there are some hoops you have to jump through, some calculations you must make based on so many cents per mile depending on how many miles you drove that vehicle. So it does enter into the picture there. Greg, one other question or comment on meal deductibility. For those meals where there is no overnight stay, and we get into some gray areas here, if it's truly a business meal, you're going out to discuss business, 
Like, I just went to a recreation council meeting that included a meal. That, as I read it, is deductible. My caller association has a breakfast meeting once a year. That meal is probably deductible. I'm not going to say absolutely. It may not be the meal you're paying for. It may be the cost of the education that you're paying for at that point. Also, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Virgil, because there's another fine-tuning point on this. The entertainment aspect, if, if you're not away from home overnight, but you and another one or two or three callers have stopped for refreshment, and you pay the tab for everybody, that's an entertainment expense. To my understanding, not restricted by the overnight rule. Therefore, 80% deductible. So there's a distinction there. You yourself or you and your spouse buy a meal without staying overnight. That's meals, not deductible. Entertainment expense is a little bit different area and probably deductible. Any other questions before we wrap it up? You've been a wonderful audience. My thanks to Roy Gada and George. We got one comment by Roy before we break up. Uh, one other thing on, on the uh, computers. I know some of you may have seen some of the uh, Corio programs. I have two different ones if anybody just wants to look at them at another time in my room. Uh, I'm not selling any of them. I'm not, I just happen to have uh, one on a PC and one on a Mac if someone wants to take a look at them.